introduce myself, let me just say that this makes me feel a little bit like Madonna in the 90s. I feel a little bit like I'm going to break into, into dance. Um, so my name is Lisa White. Uh, I run a company called Spireworks. Um, I'll tell you about Spireworks a little bit later um, in the context of my presentation. Um, first off, let me say, because I've had a few sound issues and other events myself, if you can't hear me, wave. Just wave violently and I'll shout louder. Um, second, my topic is going to diverge, I think, a little bit from the topics that you've been seeing for the rest of the day. Um, I, I've worked in sustainability. I, 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 I've worked with a number of organizations on um, their corporate sustainability issues. Um, and I believe in green. But I think uh, we, the, the topics of, of, of green and sustainable energy, waste management, recycling, water management, etc., they've been around since as long as my career has started. Um, but businesses are still paying lip service to them. So we're missing a trick. And what I'd like to talk to you about is, you know, what are we missing and, and how do we start to tackle that and look to more broadly apply the topic of sustainability to sustainable business? Um, first off, I'm struggling with this to microphone. <laughs> first off, I wanted to start with a quote, so famous author, Maya Angelou. And it was, it was she that said, you're never going to remember what I say, you're never going to remember what I do unless I fall down. And um, what you're going to remember is how I make you feel. Um, and there's two reasons I wanted to, to say this in the beginning. One, because um, I, I want to be honest about my, uh, my attempt to manipulate you. I want you to go away feeling warm and fuzzy and interested, um, regardless of what I say. And two, because I think this is the, 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 the key to the trick that we're missing when it comes to sustainability. We don't look at how we impact people. We don't look at how we impact each other. We don't look at why employees don't leverage the solutions that businesses are putting in place to make us more green. We don't look at why businesses don't do more in the green space. Um, and I, that's the lens through which I'd like to, to talk to you to, today. Okay, just for good measure, I put in a few nice green pictures to prove that I am, I am passionate about sustainability. You know, I've worked in green IT, I've worked with corporates in their, their sustainability reports. Um, but I do think, so I googled sustainability while I was prepping for this, and all of the images that came up were green. And I think that's missing a trick. I do. I think that's missing the element of sustainable business. It's missing the element of people. So I looked for a different kind of, of definition. First off, in the dictionary. So Oxford English Dictionary says that sustainability is the ability to maintain something at a certain level. And that's, that's much broader than ecology. That's much broader than planet. So that could apply to uh, business profit, it could apply to jobs, hell, it could even apply to happiness. You know, so why aren't we dealing with this at a much broader level? Um, and there are systems that, there are systems that do this, that have been around for a long time. So the triple bottom line system is one that I would have used with a number of clients predominantly in Switzerland, um, that are interested in combining their reporting um, around bottom line with their reporting around their impact upon the planet and the impact upon people. But I've, I've been a long time, I've been a corporate stooge for a long time. I run my own business now, but I'm, you know, I, I know the corporate world better than I know, um, uh, I know small businesses. And, and, and most of this in this space, and certainly in this space, um, organizations pay lip service to. We, 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 we do stuff, we say we're doing stuff, but we do it for a reputational reason or often a regulatory reason. We don't do it because we're passionate about it. We don't do it because it's important to the purpose of our business. Instead, we do it because we, you know, we feel a bit guilty for leaving our, our children in the lurch and with respect to our impact on the planet. And, and nowhere, you know, I think there are much more qualified people than me to talk through the planet aspect of this, um, but nowhere are we tackling the issue of the impact on people and how a sustainable business takes that into consideration. Uh, and when I say people, I mean everything from employees and customers through to shareholders, because business shareholders need to be kept happy as well. Um, if you don't believe me, have a look at this statistic. So according to the latest Gallup poll, only 13% of employees worldwide are actively engaged. And actually, um, globally again, and Ireland is very similar in terms of figures, um, globally there are 20% of, of employees actively disengaged. So there's more people working against your organizations than there are working for the organizations actively. That's, 
Sorry, but that's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. Work should be a better place to be because your customers, whether they be commercial or individual, um, are only as happy as your, as your frontline staff, as your frontline employees. Now, I'm very critical of the way organizations are, are run today. I'm conscious of that. I often get slapped on the wrist for being controversial. Um, but it's, it's tough times, right? So the average life expectancy of a business is much, much shorter than it ever used to be. So 15 years, you know, rather than 50 years ago, we were talking three score years, almost a century. Um, and the last, in the last 15 years, even since this triple bottom line was defined in the early 1990s, um, there are more than half of the, the Fortune 500 companies that have just disappeared. And if you take into account those that have, have not found their way out of the Fortune 500 list, that number goes up to 88%. So it's tough times. It is tough times, and that's partly to do with disruption, and um, disruptive technologies, changing consumer habits, changing commercial habits. But it can also be read in the light of, you know, organizations are decreasing their attention to the kind of things that will keep them in business for a long period of time. So, here's my sales bit. <laughs> This took me back to my dream of setting up the company, or so setting up Spireworks. Um, I, I'm traditional change management um, by trade. I've been in consulting for a lot of my career, financial services, manufacturing, big pharma. Um, I dreamt of a different way to do things, a different way to support large businesses in their, their um, dreams to adapt to a, a rapidly changing future. Uh, so our goal is to uh, make work better for people that we work with within our organization and for our clients and, and therefore for their customers and therefore for their shareholders. So my argument is that making work better for everybody also supports the bottom line. And we work as a, essentially as a living organism, so a global network of interconnected consultants. And, and that theory, the theory upon which I base the business is based on some models in um, in this book, so this is the latest instantiation, let's say, of, of these organizational models, and um, it's based on lots of uh, former information um, in and around the topics of spiral dynamics, organizational theories, developmental psychology, etc. I'll take you on a whistle-stop tour through the layers of this organizational theory. Um, I'm going to pop three layers up first, because these three are the ones that you'll be familiar with the ways in which we organize ourselves today. So, um, the Frederick Laloux, who's the, the author, um, and you know, previous experts before him uh, have purported or, or, or modeled, let's say, the historical, um, almost gang-based organization uh, along the, the wolf path. You know, so you'll see organizations, and they exist today in the form of, you know, take the mafia or organized crime, um, organizations where the, the often alpha male, you know, the, the one that's most charismatic at the top, drives things and, and decisions are made based on fear and power. Um, that evolved into a more hierarchical model, so think of the army, uh, with very extreme stability but very little upward mobility. Um, and then you'll be familiar with the traditional organizations that I'm sure you know, most people fit into this bucket or between these two buckets most most organizations, um, where the analogy is a machine. So there's different cogs and, and, and wheels that, that move together to create the organizations as we know them today. And each of these layers scales to a greater extent. Um, Lalu's perspective, and mine, and that's what I take into my consulting work, uh, is that this model is no longer fit for the future. So there are future models, or theories of future models that are starting to emerge. Now, you may be familiar with the idea, and, and I would liken this to green, to this ecological sustainability. Um, the, the green layer of an organization is a democratic one. It's consensus driven. The family is the, is the analogy when we're talking about this. So I've done a lot of work with the UN. This is what they claim to be. This is what they try to be. Um, unfortunately, that leads to a lot of inertia. Driving consensus across a large group at scale is, is hard. It's hard to do, so it's hard to get stuff done. And, and Lalu presents this idea of a teal organization, where, and these are the bits that are really important to me, people come together in different permutations in an organic way if they share a particular objective or goal. And 
people are whole beings. So I, I, I'd also, uh, and, and, and this is you know, one of my bits of advice, uh-oh, I'm, I'm talking too much. Um, people are whole individuals where uh, uh, they bring their hopes and fears and positives and negatives to work. And, and the organization has evolutionary purpose. So a goal beyond money, a goal to be beyond profit, the profit follows that goal. Okay, so what I wanted to get onto was the silver bullet solution to make this happen. Um, first bit of bad news, there isn't one, but I have three bits of advice that I wanted to leave you with. Um, one, making this happen, or making this real, and, and creating a business that's sustainable in the future, and means focusing on your people. Not on your technology, not on IoT, not on data, I'm sorry, and I'm a, I'm a technologist originally, I'm very passionate about disruptive technology, but it's your people that are gonna make or break your business in the future. And they're not motivated by the things that you think they're motivated by. Giving them more money is not gonna make them more happy. Once their needs are met, what you need to focus on is, is, is these three points, right? This comes from developmental psychology. They, they, they want a degree of independence. They want the ability to improve themselves. Um, and there needs to be an overarching purpose that isn't just financially related. And that's for all human beings, whether you're talking about your CEO or your receptionist, or everybody in between. The second bit of rec uh, the second recommendation is that you know, we need to get on board with living in a different era. You know, we're not your your key assets are no longer your products and services. Your key assets are the relationships you build with your employees and your colleagues and your customers and your shareholders. Um, and it's only by getting getting on top of and understanding how to work within those relationships that will create sustainable models that, that survive into the future. And third, so last but not least, um, and this is my process for working with InspireWorks, you have to uh, uh, apply a more adaptable and agile process to the stuff you do. So I used to do big program management, big multi-million dollar, multi-year programs of change. They don't work anymore. They certainly don't work with disruptive technology and they don't work in a high risk environment. They don't work in a world where we didn't expect Brexit and Trump, but they happened anyway. We need to be able to roll with changes. And that comes from you know, trying things, prototyping things, and learning from that, and using that to do something else. Think evolution, so that was, that was my analogy for that. That's the way the organic world works. What I'll do is skip briefly over the names of companies who've done this and say nothing, because I know I'm relatively short on time. Um, point you briefly to a case study on our website where you know this is not just random companies like Netflix that are making this kind of organization happen. I've done it. I've done it with clients and I've done it with clients that are very traditional industries. Um, and last, and I wanted to finish on something uh, nature related, environmental related. Um, my, my point here is this, uh, the natural world has created far more complex systems than we have ever managed to create with organizations ourselves, than we have ever managed to build in manufacturing. Um, why not take a lesson out of, of their work and use a model much like that uh, displayed here with a flock of birds? So there is no leader here. There's no hierarchy amongst these birds. It's every individual bird's job to make sure he or she is the same distance from the six or seven others around them. And through that, they manage something much more complex than if there is a single leader telling them all what to do. That's the theory. Um, any questions or comments? I'd be more than happy to engage and chat. Uh, otherwise, that's me.